Recording in progress. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Before I begin, I need to pray. Father God, we just come boldly before your throne of grace. We thank you so much for being full time in our life. We ask that you please allow us to receive your word today. Please let it marinate and, and resonate in our hearts so that we can be obedient to your word, God. We ask that you just please give us a double portion of your love, mercy, and grace. We also come boldly before your throne, God, and we ask that you remove every barrier, obstacle, and concern out of our life, out of our path. So we lay these things at your throne of grace, God, and we ask that you handle them for us. We thank you so much that you give us compassion and that you show us love in each and every day. So, God, we just ask that you just please allow your word to just stay hidden in our hearts. So we just ple plead the blood of Jesus over your word, God, and we just ask that it would accomplish that which is sent out to do in our actions, in our reactions, in our in our way that we build our relationships with people and, and friends, our network, God. We ask that you just please allow us to demonstrate your word. Let us be more like you. Each time if we fail, God, just get us back focused on you, God. We want to live a life that is pleasing to you, God. Whatever it takes for us to be able to fulfill your plan, will, and purpose, God, please allow your will to be done. Most importantly, Lord, please allow us to receive your Holy Spirit. Quicken us with your Holy Spirit. And I just want to say thank you so much for just being full time in my life. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for just being able to guide me. And I pray that you will lead me in this discussion. Allow me to discuss everything that I need to today. Please do not allow me to don't, don't let me forget anything. Allow me to minister grace to those that are listening in a way that is edifying to them. Let your word be able to provide hope and and um, faith faith to those that are feeling hopeless and, and with despair. Um, God, we, we all want to be able to thrive in society. We have access to your word. So allow us to be more like you. Allow us allow our hearts to be more like you, our actions and reactions. And allow our thinking and our minds to be more like you, God. Do not allow us to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So we cancel every satanic tongue spoken against us in the name of Jesus Christ. And we redeem your assignment upon our life. In Jesus' name, it is sealed in your blood. Amen. Thank you all so much for joining me today on Laws, Life, and Health. Let's talk about it. So um, today I am going to continue on in the discussion of women's health. This has been a real trending topic. And so um, hopefully I'll be able to get done with it uh, today or if not today on Sunday. Uh, so let me just go ahead and dive deep into the word. Um, but before I do, uh, a few housekeeping rules. One, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the q a if you're joining me via web uh zoom webinar and i'll be sure to respond to you there if you are joining me via any of the audio apps please go ahead and um, put your questions there um if you're on spotify iHeartRadio, radio any of those uh audio apps please go ahead and just put your questions there and i'll be sure to respond to you um the next thing is if you wanted to suggest a topic Um, please go ahead and put that in the Q and A. One moment, I'm sorry about this. So if you wanted to suggest a topic, please go ahead and put them in, um, send me an email at Deanna Watson, that's D-E-A-N-N-A -N -N -A, at SuddenChangesCorporation.org. Also, if you were interested in becoming an author or if you wanted to um, do some community service, maybe possibly uh, do some mandated community service or volunteer if you need it maybe college credit to complete an internship, please go ahead and send that email to info at suddenchangescorporation.org. Also, if you need us to get prayer, go ahead and send that email request to 
Laws Life Health at SuddenChangesCorporation.org. All right, so let's dive in the word today. So I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. So I have been talking about Eve and the different um, things that Eve is doing, right? Um, when she was created, when God created Eve. So um, I went over a bunch of different scriptures. I just want to do basically like a recap of what I went over so I could sort of transition over into uh, Sarai or Sarah, Abraham's wife. So um, Eve in Hebrew is Strong's number 2332 and is pronounced Kavval. It is spelled Kavval, C-H-A-V-V-A-H, and it means life giver, first woman. Eve was basically, she was the first woman to dominate a man. She also made Adam give up his position as head so that he could listen to her and eat from the forbidden tree that God commanded them not to eat from. So Adam was the first man to have passivity, which is submissiveness to the woman. Um, he basically listened to everything that she said when God had um, basically created him in God's image. So Adam was created in the image of God. Woman was created from the from in the image of God as well, but she came out of man. So um, the man is the head; he's the ruler in the in the marriage. Okay, this is why God says a man leaves his father and mother and is united unto his wife, and the two become one flesh. Um, so woman was derived from man. We see this in Genesis two twenty one through twenty three. And the woman, she was deceived and convinced the man to follow in the deception of her pleasures. We see this in uh, 1 Timothy 2, chapter 14. I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 14. And so God had punished Eve. And we see this in Genesis 3 and 16. So the word rule is Strong's number 4910. And it's pronounced in Hebrew as Mashal. Um, it's spelled Mashah, Mashal, M-A-S-H-A-L. And it means to rule and have dominion, governor and reign. So that's what God wanted us to have. He wanted us to, you know, basically dominate the earth and everything in it. Um, so when you dominate something, that doesn't mean for you to misuse it or mistreat it. So, so just as much as the husband is the rule over the wife, the same way we as dominators of the earth and everything in it, we should also be respecting it as well, okay? So you appreciate the gifts as God, what God has given you, not in a way to um, misuse it, okay? So Eve is the mother to all of those that continue to be disobedient to God because of their desires to please flesh or please self. What I wanted to do is clarify that a little bit. So when we look in the word... Um, uh, like what I was, let's see here. Let's go back. So in Genesis 3, 18, let's go to Genesis 3, 18. Genesis 3, 18. So I'm just waiting on the internet to come up. Okay. We could actually look at more than just uh, verse 18. So we see that um, when we look at verse 21, it says, the Lord God made garments of skin uh, for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So what this means is that God made us into the human form, our flesh. So um, before that, we were a living soul, living spirit. So um, we are also, we have a living spirit living on the inside of us because God has allowed his breath to live on the inside of us. So the, basically, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And he drove the man out. He placed on the east side of the garden of, of Eden a uh, cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So um, there was no way for them to get to the tree of life. 
the interesting part about this is that yes eve is the mother to all of those that continue to be disobedient to god because of their desires to please so but i wanted to point out a few things when we make mistakes you know that is the the desires of our flesh usually our mistakes is always going to equate to sinful nature we see in matthew um no it's i don't think that that's matthew we see in hebrews let's look here i wasn't that one okay we see in romans chapter 7 if you go to romans chapter 7 it says in verse 18 for i know that good itself does not dwell in me that is in my sinful nature so in the sinful nature good cannot dwell right so then mistakes are going to take place um wrongs are going to be implemented and there's a lot of different levels of different sins that is going to be incorporated in a person's life why because good cannot dwell in a place of the sinful nature and so we continue to mess up sometimes we do mess up every single day and we have to repent for our sins because we fall short all the time because of our flesh, our self, our our self um, pleasures, our self desires, the desires that is lurking within us seeks to be satisfied. It always wants to be satisfied. So um, it says, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. So this is what Paul is saying. Like he has a desire to do good, but he can't carry it out because of his sinful nature. So our, the spirit of God wars with our flesh because it, our flesh is under a curse. Our flesh was under a condemnation. So we receive salvation through Christ when we authorize Christ to be a part of our life. When we understand and recognize, we confess that Jesus is Lord and that he died on the cross for our sins and that he resurrected and he is our God. And so we acknowledge this. We receive God. We receive God's salvation. But what happens is we fall short because of the sinful nature, because of our desires to satisfy the flesh. So what it's saying is, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. So sometimes the moments in your life, you feel like you can't carry it out. You can't like stick to this. It's like, it's a war in your mind. It's a war in your body. It's a war in the flesh, right? For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do this i keep on doing so it's like you have all of these goal objectives that to do good but yet and still you still end up doing that thing that god does not want you to do and it's like okay well i've done so much so many things the right way but now when it's time for me to really let go of this desire or this sexual desire. Why is it so hard to let go of a sexual desire? It's just a sexual desire. So like, okay, I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't do a lot of different things. I have self-discipline in many areas when it comes to, you know, like I don't go out to clubs and to parties and doing all of these things. But it's like, okay, even with being disciplined in many other different areas, why is the urge for sexual desire so enormous to satisfy a desire that is immoral? Because fornication is a sexual desire that is not what God wants us to do, be doing. So God honors like marriage. God honors the relationship between a husband and a wife. And so I've talked about polygamy and how God, you know, it's always problems in that. And I've talked about the scriptures surrounding that. But I just really wanted to talk about these internal inconsistencies that we all have. 
It's like, okay, you can be so strong in many areas of your life, but it may be one or two th different things where you're lacking, where you're weak. It's like, okay, I am weak with my sexual desires. I am weak with my, my attitude of frustration, right? So it's like, okay, you get frustrated with people. You don't have patience for people. All of these things are not signs of love. God is love. And it's like, okay, so if we love God, we are supposed to be trying our best to make sure that we're doing the right thing with what God wants us to do. Not trying to satisfy our desires of sexual desires, of frustrated, frustration or justifications for your acts of meanness or acts of uh you know judgmental so it's so many different things that god doesn't really want us to be doing but yet paul is saying here he says look for i do not do the good i want to do but the evil i do not want to do this i keep on doing so this is what he's saying in romans uh chapter 7 in verse uh what verse is this this is verse um in verse 19 so he's saying like the evil is something that he just keep on doing even though he want to do good it's like he have the intent to do good but his actions is constantly in contradiction to good and when you see when you think of good and right we have to we have to correlate that to righteousness because God wants us to have righteousness and to be good. So the problem here is that it's a battle internally with our flesh and the Holy Spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit is like directly connected to God. But see, we, our flesh is telling us, okay, so this is, you want to satisfy your desires. You want to eat unhealthy. You want to defile your body. So you just smoke, just go ahead and smoke some marijuana. Go ahead and get drunk, right? It's like, okay, these are things that you think will be okay. But in actuality, your thinking is interfering with your actions and your behavior. It's also interfering with your ability to please god so what god wants us to do is go to war with our desires you have your mind you have your thoughts your thoughts are formulated in a way where it influences your mind your thinking influences your mind your thinking influences your behavior your behavior influences your reactions to people. It influences your belief system and including how you commune with God. So what I'm learning here, I'm learning every single day of my life that guess what? I am going to have internal inconsistencies. So it's like the flesh is always going to be doing that. Yes, we could be perfect in areas where we are mature. That means that like, okay, I am disciplined when it comes to my academics. I'm going to stay focused in school. I'm also disciplined in reading and understanding what the word of God says. I'm disciplined when I can hear the voice of God. But when it comes to certain things like, sexual thoughts like why is my mind thinking these things and it's like okay well wait i want to do what is good but you know it's like these feelings keep erupting that isn't from god so that's when we really have to sit back and say analyze our life and say okay well wait you know like i i held off all this time so now why am i thinking about sexual activity why it's because our flesh wants to satisfy its desires so when you're thinking of these the sexual acts right that isn't something that god wants you to do if you're not married god blesses the marriage
God acknowledges marriage. God respects the marriage. Everything about God, it respects the marriage. You understand? So, like, if you're if you're having sexual intimacy intimacy with someone who's not married, you're not married to that person. You all are communing and doing things that's outside of the approval of God. So that's what we would be doing if one is continuing on in sexual activities and sexual behaviors. So like, once again, let me read this again. Romans chapter seven. I'm going to start from verse 14 and I'm going to read down. So um, I'm going to go back up. So we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. So the words slave to sin means like we're, we're condemned to sin, you know? So like, this is a part of the battle right here. This is the battle. The battle is getting free and being set free from sin. The battle is like, okay, no, you're not going to always do things perfect. No, you're not. You're, you're going to make mistakes. But it's about what you do when you make that mistake. How do you reconvene? How do you, you know, like turn it around? So it's like we have to have self-reflexivity. We have to look at our self-reflection and say, okay, is this what I'm doing? Is this an act that is pleasing God? If I follow through with these thoughts that I'm having and, and, and have these beliefs, is this a belief that God would agree with? Is this an action that God would agree with? Right? And so we will internally know right from wrong because God has gifted us with the Holy Spirit. So we know on the inside when things are right and when things are wrong. So it says that being sold as a slave to sin is what happened because of Eve's actions. So Jesus Christ has to manifest in the flesh in order to take the keys of death back from Satan because everyone was perishing because of their condemnation to sin. So in verse 15, I do not understand what I do. It's like Paul is saying he can't even understand himself. It's like you want to do right. You want to do the good thing that God wants you to do, but yet and still you keep doing the thing that God doesn't want you to do. And so he's saying, I do not understand what I do. It's confusing to him because it's like at this moment, you want to do right. You want to please God, but yet it's like your flesh, your flesh won't let you. But this is what God is saying. God wants us to control our flesh, not from our own power, because we don't have the ability within our own power to let go of our desires. So we have to walk diligently with the Holy Spirit. And so um, it says, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. Listen to that verse 16. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. See, the law is good. What he's saying is, look, it's good because he still do what he don't want to do. Because that thing which he wants to do. That's what he do. But yet and still, he's still doing things he don't want to do. And so the things that he don't want to do, those are the good things. Because he's for you, he's forcing himself to do the good thing. So he do what he don't want to do. And it's like we have to, this is where it gets me. Because it's like, I don't want to party. I don't want to get drunk. I don't want to do high risk activities such as like uh, scuba diving or bungee jumping or riding on high risk motorcycles. I don't want to do those type of things. 
I don't want to participate in the things that I used to be doing. I want to do things that is pleasing to God. So it's like, how do we analyze this? How do we stop from doing the things that we don't want to do? And start doing the things that we want to do, but make those things that we want to do pleasing to God. So it's like I looked and I analyzed, I analyzed the things that I do and the things that I want. It's like, yes, you you want, like I want to have sex, right? I want to do that. But I don't want to do that. I don't want to have sex because I don't want to disappoint God. I don't want to have sex because it also is fornication and it is defiling your body. When you do that, it isn't blessing. You're not getting blessed from God through fornication. So it's like we have to change our wants to that which is aligned with what God wants for us. And what that means is that, okay, so I don't want to get drunk. So I'm not going to get drunk. So what steps am I going to take to not do that? God, Holy Spirit, help me to not get drunk. So the same way where we've overcome areas that now have become strengths are some of the same principles that we need to maintain in order to make our weaknesses strong. But see, God's power is made perfect in our weakness. Because God see out, God knows what's in our heart. He knows the things that we want to do. He knows what we want to accomplish. So it says in verse 17, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the sin living in me. So because of sin, like, you have to look at sin as a separate entity that is inside of you. So the Holy Spirit is authorized in your life, but sin is also, it can be authorized in your life too. So you have these two entities, which one is a spirit, one is an action like a sin. So you have sin and you have the Holy Spirit. Wh which one is a driving force for you? It's like it's so easy to not do anything. Then to have to create this resistance. It's similar to like somebody working out. So like when I work out, I like to do resistance training. And I don't like to do too. I mean, cardio is okay, but I really am into the resistance type of training. And so I like, um, I have a boxing bag. I work, I got a, a bunch of boxing gloves and stuff. And I also have, um, I also have a bicycle. I, I just have workout equipment. And so for me, I think that it's more important for me to do resistance training than any other type of training so it's like if you are a person that likes to work out you will understand what i'm saying so like working out there's a big difference in your results compared to when you're doing cardio or just you're doing a combination of cardio and resistance or if you just stick to resistance type of training you're going to see more results with resistance training than you would if you were to be doing cardio, just burning calories. And so the way that we rid ourselves of this sin is that we have to have resistance to sin. You know, it's kind of like this. This is what God is telling me that, that this is how I'm going to be able to push through. I have to 
have more resistance training. And, and so what that means is we have to we have to have resistance training in the word of God in a way where we're meditating on the word so much that when that when that sin is like trying to creep in and seep into your mind and seep into your actions and you trying to give in to satisfy this desire, you have to pull up and create that resistance for that sin. And so we have this resistance training that meditating on the word, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's like right at the moment, not later, not after the, the sin has been satisfied, not after you have had sex, not after the fornication is over and now you've done something. God does not want you to have sex if you're not married. You have intimacy with your spouse. So it's like we have to create resistance training for, for ourselves. And it's not like I said, you don't, we don't do it after we have sinned and had the sex. You do it right before. It's like, uh, -uh no, 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 no. I can't do this. This is, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I will not be having sex today. So that's like the resistance training. We have to train our minds and begin to meditate on the word of God right when you're feeling these urges. It's like the urge. What I noticed was like when I was smoking. You know, a lot of everybody likes smoking marijuana, but I was addicted to smoking cigarettes, seriously. And so it was kind of, it was challenging for me, but God kept telling me that the urge is going to subdue. The urge is going to go away. So you just have to understand that even though your mind is telling you, okay, you, you want this cigarette. But you don't need it. Just resist it. So it's like that resistance training that we have to build ourselves up through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I was able to quit smoking easy. But I didn't know that I would be having urges of sex as an issue. So it's like, okay. Look in here in verse 18, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. Good can dwell in us if you keep on thinking about satisfying that urge. It's like I have a, a craving for sex. I want to have sex. I'm thinking about sex. So guess what? We have to say, no, 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 no. Good is not dwelling in us right at that moment. That means that God, where is God in the equation of this situation? So if we're walking in the spirit with the spirit of God, we want God to be equipping us at all times. So when we're thinking these things right at that moment, it's like, okay, wait, 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 wait. Good is not dwelling in those thoughts. The right thing, which is righteousness, is not dwelling in that, that type of activity. You sit up there want to go beat somebody up. You want to go fight. You want to argue. You want to commit adultery. Another person want to steal. All of those things. Guess what? There is no righteousness in there. There is no goodness doing those things. But see, the problem is, is like we we kind of like look at the law and it's like, okay, well, if I do good, d just doing good isn't going to get you into heaven. That's what the Bible tells us. Doing just because you do good, it doesn't get you in heaven. Let's go to that scripture.
Okay, so we're going to Matthew chapter 19, verse 16 through 30. So it says, a man came to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? Jesus answered, wait, wait a minute. Let me go to the NIV version. One second. It says, Jesus, wait, it says in Matthew 19, verse 16 through 30. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. Let me explain this verse 19 though. Matthew chapter 19 verse 19. Now, a lot of people kind of get confused about this, but I want to take this one analogy about honor your father and mother and explain why this is so important. So this scripture, uh, Matthew 19 and 19, honor your father and mother, because regardless if our parents are not there to do the things that we want them to do, when we want them to, we still will honor them. That means that we're still being trained in a way for when you get grow up and you get older, you understand what is right from wrong. You have the ability now to be judged for your actions because while you're a baby and you're growing, you're not, you're not capable of being, having judgment. You're not capable of this judgment because you're not aware of responsibility, of accountability, of taking ownership. So when you become of the age where you know right from wrong, then you're accountable for your actions. And so this is something that really, really kind of gets me with, within the Baptist church too. And I don't really want to like deviate from the topic at hand, but you know, like we are supposed to be accountable. We are judged for what we know. A, a child cannot give you um, accountability. So God allows children to be exempt. So, but when you get to that age where you know right from wrong, you are accountable for what you know. So when it says honor your father and mother, so like when you're growing up and your parents don't do all the things that you want them to do, like, oh, well, I want this car, I want this mom, or I want this dad, you know, like you want some things to be done, like you want to go shopping when you want to go shopping, you want to go you want to get allowance when you get a want to get allowance. You want to go to the mall when you want to. You want to go out to eat with friends and do those type of things. But the, the point of it is, is that sometimes our parents isn't going to always be there to pull us through right when we want them to. And sometimes some parents won't be there at all. And so you have to understand it's like God will show us through the way that we honor our parents, the way you honor your father and mother is the way you are building. The, the, that's the way that you're forecasting your relationship with God. Because if you can have patience when your parents are not there, that means that when you get to a, a certain age, you're going to be able to have God in your life and still be able to have patience for God. But if you don't have patience for your parents, you don't have patience. You like, oh, no, no. Now you disrespecting your parents. Then what does that mean? That means you're not going to have patience for God. You don't understand why your parents are doing some of uh, this thing or that thing. It isn't the point for you to understand. Just know that they're looking out in your best interest. So what happens is if you don't understand them, when you get to a certain age where you're, you're responsible for your rights and wrongs, you're not going to be able to understand what God is saying to you.
So God wants us to honor our father and mother because of the fact that it teaches us how to build our future relationship with God our forecasted relationship so people forecast into the future they project what it can be so your relationship with your parents are probably very similar with your relationship with god some people say oh i don't know how to talk i don't know how to i don't know how to do that no so how do you talk to your parents how do you communicate with your parents? It all starts from honoring your father and your mother. So the way that you have your relationship with God, if it's rejecting God, so how did you reject your parents? What did they do? So everything can go back to that point. So when we think about entering into the kingdom of heaven, we have to think about our obedience in a way is similar to the way we engage with our parents. So now that I'm now that I'm I've, I've gotten to this spiritual perspective and this spiritual journey that God is, you know, having me walk into the into this righteousness. It's like okay, now I'm seeing. All right, now there is some um, disobedience. In uh, quite a few areas of my life that I need to change. And so now I got to look back. Okay, so start. Where did the disobedience with God? Because if we continue to give in to sin, our sinful nature and not resist it, not have this resistance training, that God has gifted us with through the his word, through the power of having access of the, to the Holy Spirit. You know, so like God has gifted us with this. So how do we analyze it from that angle? Okay, so God, I I have been thinking these sexual thoughts, these the sexual activity, these things are not aligned with what God wants for my life. But where did it start? It started with how did I honor my parents? Because like I I know for sure that I, I love my dad. My dad has always been there. My mom, I do have respect for her, but I'm very distanced from her. So it's like we have to analyze ourselves and understand where is your disobedience rooted from? Where does the disobedience come from? Where does the, you know, actions that is leading to being disobedient to God, where is it coming from? So I have to analyze myself and say, okay, well, wait. Yes, my, my parents would tell me to do something and I would not listen. And I'm sure a lot of people have, but there, there are a lot of people in this world that do respect their parents, that, that, that do honor their mother and father. And so they have a great relationship with God because now, guess what? They were able to listen to what God was saying. So I don't think it is really about, if we go back to Romans, we go back to Romans uh, 18. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature. So for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. See, you, we, we have the desire to do good, but we also have the desire to do what? We have the desire to satisfy our flesh. And we have to say, okay, if this act of disobedience, is it more important than the desire to please God? Is it, is it okay for me to satisfy this desire and then disappoint God? 
Or should I satisfy the desire and disappoint God and then repent? Satisfy the desire, disappoint God, or be obedient and please God. So you have two different scenarios. One is satisfy the desire and disappoint God. The other is satisfy God and be obedient. I mean, I'm sorry, be obedient to God and please God. So we have to outweigh these imbalances of our desires. So you satisfy the sexual desire and disappoint God or be dis be obedient to God and please God. It's like, which one do you choose? And, and so we don't have to continue to like act like we don't have these feelings because Paul is saying he having the feelings. He having the feelings. He's having these internal feelings that is inconsistent to the point where he says in Romans 7, 15, I do not understand what I do. I do not understand what I do. And then we look in, in verse, in, in, in verse uh, 6, 18, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. So it's like, okay, well, wait, do I satisfy this, this desire of sexual sin and disappoint God? And, or do I be obedient and please God? See, we have to look at now, which, whichever one we choose. Now, what do we do after? So let's, let's go into that. Let's talk about it because see, this is real. This is unfiltered language, understanding of God, understanding the language, the words that is being used in the word of God, understanding what we are really actually going through in this world. So what do we do after our choice? So let's see which choice. We, let's analyze the perspective from each choice. So now, satisfy the desire of sexual sin. And disappoint God. What do we do after that? See, many times people are continuing on into they fulfilling their sexual desire. They're going to fulfill their sexual desire. They're going to make sure that their desires is being satisfied and pleased. Okay, they disappointed God. But guess what? You have people who say, okay, God, forgive me. And then they just do it again. And it's like, okay, do you have conviction in your heart? Do you feel bad about what you did? Do you feel bad about, you know, uh, about stealing? Do you feel bad about giving false testimony against somebody? Do you feel bad for not loving people, for not loving your neighbor, for not loving your family, for not loving people that need it? How do you feel when, when you're not doing the right thing? See, because if it causes hurt to someone else in any way, that's not the right thing. Now, don't get me wrong. Some people will try to manipulate this. They'll say, oh, well, okay, so what do you mean by that? Do you mean that if... You know, like if I want to have sex with you and you don't want to have sex with me and I'm, I love you and why are you don't want to have sex with me that that's hurting my feelings. So it's not being motivated by no negativity. We have to love in a way where it pleases God. Does this action, does my actions after my actions. Please, God. So those are the things that we have to examine and those are the things that we have to look at.
So we see here that Paul is having difficulty trying to choose. So if you choose to satisfy that desire and allow sin to continue to live on the inside of you, that means that you reject God altogether. Because it's saying, okay, you're doing something that you don't feel bad about, even though it disappoints God. You continue to do it over and over again, even though it disappoints God. And you don't feel bad about it. How can God work with that? So now God is going to say, okay, you know, these are your choices. I'm going to show you why those choices does not work. So when other things start happening, like outside of your relationship now, it could be in a number of different things taking place. It's not because of you just have bad luck. It's not because, you know, you don't have favor over your life. It is not because God don't love you. It's not because God want to punish you. It's not because God did this to you. No. It's not. What God does is he teaches us why it's important to be obedient to him. God didn't do that. God didn't do this to you. God just allows certain things to happen so you can make different choices. So let's look at 19, Romans 7, 19. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. So he blaming his actions on the sin, his sinful nature. His sinful personality, his sinful character. Like you have a sinful mind. It's all you think about is sex. You have a sinful mind. If all you think about is making money, you have a sinful, covetous mind. You have a greedy mind. You have a sinful nature. We all have a, we all come from a sinful mind. A sinful nature. We need God in order to be cleansed from our sinful nature. Because we're going to ponder on that sin. This is what I want to do. Because why? What reason why? Because no one is stopping you. God isn't forcing you to be obedient. So when we go back here to understand that Eve is a mother to all those that continue to be disobedient to God because of their desires to please self. So God does not want us focusing on just ourselves and pleasing ourselves. We got to create this resistance training and say, you know what? I don't want to disappoint God. So let's, so let's examine if we made the other choice. Because if you make the choice, I you satisfy the desire, you disappoint God, but you keep on doing it, God is going to allow things to happen in your life where you're going to have to, you're going to eventually call upon the name of the Lord. Because God doesn't want us to continue to go, keep going through things when he's speaking to us. He wants us to live a life that is of obedience. So let's let's finish looking at this one guy. Matthew 19, 16 through 30. This is the rich and the kingdom of God. So basically, um, in verse 18, uh, so this this man, 
he come up to Jesus. He wants to know how can he get have eternal life. So Jesus says, you shall not murder. You shall not, not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony on your father and your mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, well, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Okay, so let's look at the word perfect again. And we're going to look at it up from this scripture uh, in Matthew 19 verses 21. So go to the uh, strong from coordinates and type in the word perfect. Um, it should come up for Matthew chapter 19. It should come up for the exact chapter. So let me just go ahead and explain what the strong concordance is. It, it should I should be able to explain this briefly. I do this every single day on my podcast for all of the new listeners that really would like to understand what the strong concordance is used for. So we have the Bible, the Holy Bible. It is actually called the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? Um, this Bible is the Holy Bible is comprised of two different testaments one is the old testament and then we have the new testament so the old testament is from the books of genesis to the book of uh, malachi the new testament is from matthew the books of matthew through uh the book of revelation so we have 66 books in the bible um the old testament is written in hebrew scrolls which is part of the dead sea scrolls um we have the first five chapters of the bible which is considered the Torah or the law. These, this is the law that God created. It is in the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And we see that the law actually is the Torah. And um, this is what many Jews are really focusing and plant, placing emphasis on the law, the Torah. So when we look at the, the New Testament, um, which is um, written in Greek, we can analyze the, the, the gospels of Jesus too. So the gospels can be found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right. It talks about the life of Jesus and um, how Jesus was 100% man. And Jesus was also 100% God. Okay. And uh, we see this in Hebrews chapter two and verse seven, Hebrews two, verse seven. Okay. Um, where Jesus, he basically became low. He became lower than the angels, right? And so that is human. He became human. So we humans are lower than the angels, okay? That's what that means. So this is in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 7, okay? And so we see that Jesus was 100% man and also 100% God. We also see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3, but I want you to realize the head of every man is, is Christ, the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So we see that the Holy Trinity is mentioned, Is I'm sorry, the Holy Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible, but what is mentioned is the Father, which is God, the Son, which is Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. So... We have three persons or th three persons within the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we see in 1 Corinthians 11 and 3 that Christ, that God is the head of Christ. So the Bible also talks about in uh, John 10 and 30, it says, I and the Father are one. So Jesus is one with God, meaning that there is a Trinity. The father, which is the head, right? In order to get to the father, you must come through the son, Jesus Christ. And then you have the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus was here on earth, um, what he did was he was crucified. And on, when he was crucified, he died on the cross for our sins, meaning that our sinful nature is automatically condemned because we do things that is not pleasing to God. And that brings us condemnation and death through sin. 
And so the way that we are transformed out of that is on the cross with Jesus. His When he died for us, his crucifixion is a representation of the debt that he paid for us being con condemned to sin. Because of our thoughts, our internal inconsistency, our inequities. These are sinful acts of what's inside of us, humans. And everything that is sinful, that is out of alignment with God, condemns us to death, spiritual death. And so Jesus paid the price for that death for the spiritual condemnation of death through our sin so we no longer condemned because we receive salvation from his blood on the cross his shedding of his blood is called a sacrificial death but for the purposes of making sure that everyone understands i want to just use layman's term language the blood of jesus washes away our sins so that we're no longer condemned to our bad behavior our bad living our bad sin but we have eternal life through his blood which gives us atonement that's basically saying you was bought with a price he paid for you and your actions with his blood on the cross so now we live through Christ. And so when he resurrected, he resurrected after the third day of being crucified. And then he was on earth for 40 days. And from that time, he was then ascended into heaven. 10 days later, he sent down the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit descended on everybody. On the apostles and stuff. So now we have that's considered 50 and that is also called the day of pentecost because it's 50 days jesus was crucified he resurrected after the third day he stayed on earth for 40 days he ascended into heaven then 10 days later he sent the holy spirit that's considered the day of pentecost 50 means pentecost and that's why it means pentecost because of jesus being here on earth 40 days after he was resurrected he was ministering to his disciples his apostles and everybody that he encountered for 40 days after he resurrected so what we see here is that in hebrews 2 chapter uh i'm sorry in hebrews chapter 2 verse 7 that jesus was just as low as the angels l lower than the angels so he was human so God became flesh. He was 100% God and 100% man. The difference is we see that Jesus did not use his godly power to defend himself at all. And that is what we can consider and look at true humility and real humbleness. So God was telling me, look, look, if you want to do better and you want to change the way that you think, Stop defending yourself. We always seem to want to defend ourselves for this and defend ourselves for this. Okay, well, you know, you had a sexual thought. What's wrong with thinking about sex? What do you mean what's wrong with it? The thought will lead you to having sex. God said, don't be doing that if you're not married. So because we're listening to people that contradict the word of God, you got to listen to the spirit that is talking to you. What spirit are you surrounding yourself with? Because some people will be like, oh, that's, that's nothing wrong with that. It's nothing wrong with this. It's nothing wrong with that. It's nothing wrong with this. And then you sit back and you look at their lives. And in their their lives is not up to part the way that you think it is. So we have to understand that what God is saying to us is, guess what? It starts with a thought. Our minds need to be transformed by the renewing, the renewing of the God's word. 
We unlearn and we renew. Unlearn and renew. Unlearn the old and renew. Renew the word of God. Be renewed in the word of God. Unlearn the old and get renewed in the new. So that's what we have to do. So when people are out here contradicting what the Bible says, but they say they believe in God, quit listening to those spirits because every single human person on earth is a living spirit. A living soul. If she says she shouldn't submit to her husband, that's a contradiction to what God says. This is why God is telling us to wake up. Let's go to this scripture. I want to really go to this scripture because it really do confirms a lot of stuff here. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this scripture. But when we look at this scripture here, go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 39. It says right here, 34, verse 34, Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. So what God is telling us here, do his word, because the Bible is inspired by God. God is telling us, look, if that's your father or if that's your mother, yes, you still honor them. But guess what? We have to separate from them. God is separating us from people that's out here contradicting his word. Whole entire churches are being segregated for contradicting the word of God. If they say, oh, well, it's okay. You don't got to listen to no man. You don't No, God said, submit yourself unto your husband as you do unto the Lord. So anything outside of that equation is a contradiction. This is the reason why you have so much sexual immorality going on in society because nobody act, nobody honors marriage. Nobody honors marriage when God wants us to honor marriage. So God is saying here in verse 39, he, he who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. What this means is that when people are out here, you didn't found so much fun into all the money you making at that job. You don't even have time to go to church. You don't even have time to pray to God because you work so much. You don't even have time to get on your knees and give glory to God and thank him for what he's done because you're outside working all day. See, that's what the Bible is saying here in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So instead of you giving glory to God for waking you up, you get right up and smoke a cigarette. You get right up and smoke a blunt. You get right up and get on the phone on Facebook. You get right up and get on Instagram. You don't give glory to God. No, no, no. You have to watch your news first. Because see, the news got to come on first before you give praise to God. You might praise God 15 hours later. Because see, you, you got so much going on in your life that you know God is not in the equation. Oh, yeah, yeah, I love God. I love God. Then I ask people, okay, so, so 
you love God, how you how have you made God a priority in your life right now? What's up? Tell me. I'm gonna tell you how God is a priority for me. Well, I pray every day. I want to talk to God every single hour. Every hour, I want to communicate with God. I can't communicate with Him when I'm asleep, so I listen to my Bible on the phone while I sleep. So, if in case I wake up, I can still hear the word of God. This the truth. So, I really, really want more and more of God in my life. So, I listen to the Bible and I love praise and worshiping. So, I cut my music up all the way on 100 and I blast it. And I praise and worship God. Every single day. When I'm not, when I'm not reading, I'm praising and worshiping. So, like, let me explain. It is not for me to compare myself to anybody. The point of the matter is, is that God wants us to make time for him. That's why it's saying here in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39, he who finds his life will lose it. Because see, this scripture is so significant. This scripture got my heart feeling convicted. I feel convicted for when I do things that displeases God. I feel convicted because I feel like, okay, I did I... Did I am I am I listening to this scripture, God? Am it this, this scripture apply to me? He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So, okay, God, am I am I making too much time for people? You know, am, am I making too much time to this this situation? Am I worrying? God, tell me, am I worrying? If I'm worrying, I don't want to worry because you, so I sit back and say, okay, you know what? I'm not going to worry about this situation because guess what? God, with his word, he created and established the heavens and the earth. So if he said that I'm the salt of the world, that means that I have power. It should be no reason why I'm sitting up here thinking that, okay, why am I focused and attenuating to this situation that's giving me worry? Absolutely not. I'm not about to, I'm not about to be focusing on this. This causing worry. Worry is a sin. That means that are we trusting God here? So in Matthew 10, 39, he who finds his life will lose it. So it, 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 is it when I satisfy these sexual desires that I have, you know, I'm, am I finding life in it? I can keep on doing it because see this sex is so good. I want to just keep on doing it. It's not about disappointing God, is it? It's just about satisfying the desires that's within me. And so no, 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 no. That's when I revert back. Oh no, God. See, I want to live my life for you. That's what this scripture is saying. Matthew 10, 39. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. It's like saying, okay, God, I have the desires of sex, but I'm not going to do it because I don't want to disappoint you. That's living for the sake of God. Until I am married, I am not going to have sexual intimacy because I don't want to disappoint you. That's living for the sake of God. So I'm not going to steal because I don't want to disappoint you. That's living for the sake of God. When we are satisfying our desires, we're living for ourselves. You're finding life in your desires. You're finding happiness in your desires you finding your happiness in instagram when you get up and you don't give glory to god before your feet hits the floor before you use the restroom in the morning by the time you on the toilet you should be thanking god thank you for waking me up your eyes not even open yet. 
Some people's eyes ain't even all the way open. They got the phone in their hand. They just looking on Instagram. They just looking through Facebook. Now, uh-uh, let me cut the news on. I have to see the news first. Before you brush your teeth, you should be thanking God for waking you up. So, yes, I make mistakes, but guess what? It's so serious for me because, see, I think about, am I choosing this desire over you, God? Is this desire more than you, God? And then when we go back to Romans, not Romans, yeah, we go back to Romans. And we're looking at what, what Paul is talking about. It's like Paul is saying, look, he want to do good. For I do not do good, do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. He just keep on doing the bad. And it's like, that is because where is the conviction? God, convict my heart. Whatever it takes, convict my heart of sexual immorality. Convict my heart from having sex without being married. Convict my heart, God. Let conviction fall on me for everything that I that everything that I do, everything that I do that displeases you, everything that I do that is disobedient to you, God. We have to be asking. You ask God for what you want. Do you want to keep on doing what you're doing, or do you want to do the right thing? Because see, doing the right thing will lead to righteousness, but doing the right thing is still not going to get you into heaven. Because see, it's about the desires that you have, the desires that is lurking within you. See, we have these desires. They just be lurking around, waiting on you to satisfy them. The desires want to control your body. Like, look, look, look. You know you need some sex. Why you don't want to have sex? Did God really say you can't have sex? Well, you know God will forgive you. It's like, wait, 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 wait. So, God gonna forgive me, so I should just do it? It's like, wait, wait, that's, isn't that what the serpent was doing to Eve? Well, did God really say you couldn't eat from the tree of the garden? You will not surely die. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. See, that's the thing. It's like, okay, well, wait, wait now. Uh-uh. See, I'm not about to do this because God going to forgive me. No, no, no. God, convict my heart. Convict my heart. And now I don't care how long the man stay mad at me for not having sex. It don't matter. Let him be mad. Stay away. I need to stay away. Stay away for a long time. So I don't think about it no more. So we have to just like really have this resistant training for ourselves. God wants us to do better. And in order for us to do better, we need to be thinking better. We need to be living better. We need to be in an environment that allows us to learn that faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God. So I'm going to end on that tonight everybody so um i know that that was kind of a lot of information but i really really do want everyone to sort of meditate on the word um um Matt, look at matthew i think that was i was in matthew chapter 19 wait was that matthew nine? no that that's matthew um uh, yeah matthew 19 wait no no Hold on one second. That is actually, it's actually Romans chapter seven. Romans chapter seven, verse seven through um, 25. Now I didn't get a chance to read the entire scripture, but I just want you all to know that it's so important for us as children of God 
to make sure that we're meditating on the word in a way that we can have this resistance training that God wants us to have. And yes, God will forgive you, but that doesn't mean that you just automatically do it and disappoint God in the process. We have to show some type of love and respect for God. God, he died on the cross for our sins. So when are you going to live for him? Why is he not important enough for you to get up and praise him in the morning instead of picking up your phone? Why is it not important to praise God and give thanks for God waking you up instead of you getting on Facebook first, instead of you smoking that blunt first, instead of you hitting that cigarette, instead of you cutting the news on, instead of you calling your friends, instead of you going straight to work. Let God be the first thing that come out of your mouth. Thank you, God, for waking me up. Thank you, God, for being in my life. Thank you, God, for your protection. Thank you, God, for dying on the cross for my sins, God. Allow me to live for you. Thank you, God. So, you know, like, I'm not perfect. I am mature. So being perfect means to be mature. I am being perfect in a lot of areas of my life. And there's areas where I need improvement. So let's be perfect and understand what perfect means according to the word of God. Perfect means tam in Hebrew. That means to be mature in nature and in action. It is Strong's number 8542. So in some areas, I'm not perfect, but in a lot of areas, I am. I am perfect because God said for us to be perfect, even as his father in heaven is perfect. Even we should be mature where we can teach the word of God, not continue to be learning the word of God. Why are you not able to teach the word of God? It's time for people to teach the word of God. God is wanting his children to get up and wake up and stand up. It's time to teach, not to be still on baby formula. Learning the practical principles of what God wants for us. That means you be had. Who in your life have you be had? See, because that's what God said. That's what God told me. He said, look, look, look. It, 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 when I was married, I went through. See, the only time you can divorce is if you're being abused or if your spouse is an unbeliever and chooses to leave. So those are the two instances, okay? Those are the only times where you can. And it talks about it in Corinthians, all right? But I'm not going to get into that. What I wanted to say specifically is that when you are with someone who's an unbeliever, they're not practicing what they're supposed to. They're not walking in the faith that God wants. You have to pray for those people and pray that they stay out of your life. Because instead of you being 500 steps ahead, this, this person and their unbelief and their doubt and their attitude of defeat has now got you a thousand steps behind in life. Because of, of a sinful thoughts and deceitful minds. So if you're deceived in one area of your life, the chances are you're going to be deceived in many other areas of your life. So we have to fight the good fight. So I want to pray for everybody. So I'm going to end on that note and I would like to pray. So I have a, a very specific prayer that I like to pray. And um, so this, this should be good. So Father God, Father God, you say in your word in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, do not be deceived for evil company corrupts good habits. Father God, do not let us be de deceived in any way that it will corrupt good habits in us, God. Heavenly Father, King of Kings, Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end and the first and the last. Every wicked person that is in our life that is distracting us or stopping us from advancing in your kingdom or misleading us or affecting us negatively, God, 
that is hurting us from advancing in your will, plan, and purpose for our life, God. Anyone that is appearing as someone who loves us but do not. Father God, we ask that you just remove them from our life. God, we ask that you cleanse our circle with the powerful blood of Jesus Christ. All the people that are devils in disguises, those people that are wolves in sheep's clothing, whether it's a family member, a co-worker, a neighbor, a roommate, a boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, or anyone in general, Father God, any person that is keeping us from fulfilling your plan, will, and purpose, God remove them from our life god until they turn away from the things that they are doing and focus on you god we want to be surrounded with people that can focus on your word god we pray that you destroy all attachments and connections of any kind with wickedness and evil god we ask that you will wake us up and keep us awakened in a way where we can that you will reveal who they are help us to never run back to them or get advice from them father god replace all the replace all the wickedness and the evil that is that we're surrounded with god with genuine the divine people that believes in you that practice your word god that believes in you genuinely god that pray without ceasing that have good relationship with you god surround us with those people god place those people into our life we ask that you will protect us from all wickedness and evil at all times in the name of jesus god we ask that you will bless us continually with spiritual discernment so that we will know who a person is and their motives before allowing them into our life and if their motives is evil or wicked god do not allow them into our life god we just plead the blood of jesus christ over us right now god over our steps over our thinking over our mind god we ask that you would help us never to feel sympathy or empathy for any evil or wickedness god we ask that you will help us to resist the devil so that he will always flee from us god we do this through being submissive to you father god we ask that you will allow us to never affiliate ourselves with, agree with, or negotiate with, or succumb to any of the offers or delicacies or tricks or traps of anything that is wicked or evil, Father God. All the corruption and that has affected or impacted our life from the, the company or evil, wicked company that we have had in our life. God, we just ask that you reverse it out of our life. We ask that you reverse it out of our minds, out of our hearts, Lord God. And we ask that you replace it with that thing which is of good rapport with you. Those things that are lovely, God, those things that are great. And, and that you replace it with your seeds and water the things in our life that you want us to accomplish accomplishing your goals is to satisfy your plan and will and purpose for our life god so we ask that you reverse all of the negativity god we ask that you convict our hearts for any and everything that displeases you god everything that is disobedient to you god convict our hearts until we turn away from it completely not just repenting away to just turn for a moment in time but repenting away where we turn away from it god so convict our hearts from the depths in the root of our hearts and the depths in the root of our minds and the depths in the root of our thinking and our thoughts god uproot all of those things that is disobedient and displeasing to you and keep our hearts convicted until we completely turn away god we want to live a life that is satisfying to you and pleasing to you god so we ask that you just please that you give us restoration in our life, that you cleanse us, that you purify us and sanctify us, Lord God. We ask that you give us spiritual refinement, Lord, and that you uplift us, God. Help us to have a better relationship with you and communication with you, God. Whatever it takes, God, let your will be done, not ours, but yours. In the name of Jesus Christ, it is sealed in your blood. Amen. All right. Thank you all so much for joining me tonight. I really do appreciate it. I, I apologize for not getting on the topic of Sarai, um, but I will get on to that on Sunday. Once again, if you want to um, contact me for anything, please send out your emails to lawslifehelp at suddenchangescorporation.org. Thank you so much once again for joining me, and um, I will see you all on Sunday. Be blessed. Thank you. Have a good night.